Well, it looks like we're live, so I'm going to start the cold open for the show. Hello, everybody. Go. Welcome to the Arkin Brothers Talk About Movies, wherein the Arkin Brothers, that being myself and my brother Matthew. I don't understand. I'm confused already. <laughs> Sometimes other people come and talk about movies. Today, the movie we're talking about is Straight Jacket, directed by William Castle. It was made in 19 or was put out in 1964 and it stars the great Joan Crawford. We are rounding out our John Joan Crawford flight, as I'd like to call it. Um, and uh, welcome to the show. Talking about cocktails that are stylish, movies great or phony, and how Tony should win and Matthew, and Matthew should win and Tony. But in the meantime. Talking about film in the meantime, the Arkin Brothers talk about movies. Hey there, Brother hey, Arkin. Hey there, Brother Arkin. How What's you happening? doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. That was a good way to start the day with that uh, screaming Joan Crawford. I, I've been doing nothing but clipping pictures from this movie and getting ready for some little posts that I can't wait for. I'm I'm getting back into uh, recutting trailers for our for our uh, movies. Oh, great. I want to try to start doing more of that. Watching that clip of her screaming is actually the most comfortable I've felt in weeks because it was sort of a balance of what's going on on the outside and what's going on on the inside. Right. And, Not quite know. so much cognitive dissonance. It's <laughs> right. the same. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I felt, uh, I felt at ease in my environment when she was screaming like that. She's insane. She's insane. She's insane. She's insane. Yeah. It's, it's madness. How, it's madness. Before we get into the movie, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm excited. We're starting a, a, a new class tonight, a workshop uh, tonight at our uh, beloved ESPA. Primary stage is ESPA, the school there. Um, we've been teaching workshops there for a long time, and we're doing online workshops with them now, and it's been really great. We're starting our thing tonight, so uh, it's always fun, day it's one. A, it's a great class you offer, too, I know. Uh, you, well, you know, some people like it. Some people who want to audition for stuff and on camera auditioning. Well, I've like sat it. in on your classes. I've I've watched you teach down in Florida. I've watched. Oh, you that's teach. true. You know what the hell you're doing. I can. Well, thank I, you, you know, sir. This isn't like a review. This somebody who hasn't uh, hasn't seen You've the. You've actually product. seen it. You've gone yeah, in there yeah. and seen it. Yeah, uh, I get it wholesale. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I do. I do. I get I, a wholesale. Do. I get actually sometimes yeah. for free. I get your advice. Well, for us, it's like you know, it's like the same as the dinner table conversation when we were growing up. We that's just true. it's an extension of that for that both is, of us. That's true. That's what it's uh, like. as this show kind of is. Yeah, just, um, that's actually how this show started. We just said, "Hey, we're doing this anyway. Maybe we should make people watch it." Pass the salt. What do you think of Joan Crawford? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Anything, any other news this week? Oh, when you get to prime, say hi to the folks at primary stages. Uh, I worked there once upon a time. I will. Right now it's a virtual, virtual place. Uh, they're, I think, between uh, having uh, offices. But if I, anybody that I see connected to, to ESPA, I will say hello. Say hello. Them. Yeah. We, uh, saw, we did see uh, uh, your friend and mine, Reed Bernie, in his fantastic show, which closed this weekend. Um, that was an incredible experience. Um, seeing him on stage is always great. Oh, he's phenomenal. If you don't know Reed, he's done film work and TV. He's really well known in, in New York theater as being one of the one of the badasses of New York theater. And man, does he bring it. His son is great, too. They, it was It's a, a two-hander. And um, his son is in it with him. And they, he was equally great. Wonderful show. And when you say uh, one of the badass, you mean badasses, not bad asses, because I do know that that he did a show called Blasted, uh, that if you'd seen it, you might have said something about, you know, bad ass about his physique. No, I wasn't talking about his oh, physique. OK, I just wanted to make sure. No, uh, <laughs> no, I was talking about his uh, 
his st- the level of the standard of which we're talking here, the level of quality of acting. Yeah. Um, we have to get Reed on the show sometime to talk about Gangland. Uh, and, that would be great. Reed would be a great guest. And Reed also has one of the all-time great clown stories of just epic clown story or a date story. I'm not sure which which you want to which category you would put it in. Uh I think I may know some of some of this story. You may, uh, he may have told me this. Right, this yeah. sounds familiar. It's a pretty epic story. Well, um okay. I think we have a plan for the new year. <laughs> yeah, we got to get him. Read and the clown story. Um well, uh, um, how are you? How, you sound busy. Like you've been busy. I know things are going. Just, the, the booze business just keeps going on and on and on. We're Maybe. on a great. Uh, e- we're on a great uh, e-commerce site called Caskers now. Caskers dot com. We're for sale there, and uh, we've started to get some reviews. Um, so anybody who watches the show, if you have, uh, if you have had Batch Twenty Two. And you want to go to caskers.com and leave us a truthful review, not asking for uh, perjury, but uh, it's helpful to know what people think of it up there. And then uh, I did come up with a drink uh, for this week's movie. Why don't you have some milk? Calm it down. Milk and batch. Milk and batch. No, it's not. That was a batch you know, that was the only thing I could think of initially. Uh, I don't know if I should go into the drink now or after we've discuss the movie for a little bit uh it might help to discuss the movie for a little bit before i go into the okay because there's things about the drink the ingredients that reflect the plot and yeah um so uh but uh, you watch anything interesting this week other than uh what was required what did we watch hmm no, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing that jumps out. It's been a busy week, so I've resorted to, uh, you know, uh, this fine William Castle movie and Somebody Feeds Phil. I think that's been the level of my ability to deal with watching things. So I don't, I don't know Somebody Feeds Phil. Oh, it's, it's a, it's a travel, travel cook food show. How do I not know this? I don't know why you don't know this. Oh. You can look it up on the Googles. I'm going to Google that. and uh, Somebody, and what... I'll tell you, somebody is S-O-M-E-B-O-D-Y. I never thought my brother would end up running a farm again. <laughs> Something that the Arkin brothers yeah. have never said. No. no Arkin brother has ever said those words. No. Nor will. N- yeah, uh, the again being the primary part. Some people have said, you probably end up running a farm somewhere. And I'd be like, yeah. A funny farm, maybe. Um, no, Somebody Feed Phil is a Netflix show uh, created and starring Phil Rosenthal, who was the creator of uh, of oh uh, the Pope of Greenwich Village. No, uh, <laughs> not the Pope of Greenwich Village. I can't think and of anything. Every, everybody loves Raymond. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, he created that show, and he was like, he's a comedy writer, and I guess maybe he did some stand up at one point, but he's just this kind of delightful, childlike, um, crazy man who goes around the world and, and eats and, ta- and meets people. Well, and he's very positive, very kind of like uplifting uh and ridiculous he has zero um like he has nothing to say about food the most he says about it is oh that's great you know like that's delicious that's as that's as far as it goes wonderful yeah oh my gosh uh well i watched um i watched a show you're gonna find this hard to believe but it was a brit box original a british detective Show. Get out of town, Matthew. I did. I watched a British detective show take place in Scotland. Right. Is it called the Damp Sweater? <laughs> the Damp. No, it's called Redemption. The case of the the case of the Damp. The, damp. the moistened lambs yeah. wool sweater. Takes place in Scotland. It's called Redemption. It's a Brit box original. It's wonderful. Okay. It was quite good. If you're into the British crime detective, am stuff, I ever? Am I, I ever? You don't care at all. No, I am because this is a segue. 
It is. This a is a segue into another announcement that we both have something to announce today, which is that speaking of, you know, UK conceived crime shows, a show that you and I are in dropped oh, that's today. Right. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Tell us it about dropped it. today. Uh, well, our friend of show and uh, our friend Peter Stray, uh, who directed uh, a movie we talked about, uh, Canaries or Alien Party Crashers, otherwise known as Alien Party Crashers, I should say. Yeah. Um, he created a new a new podcast about uh, the story of Hans Gruber from Die Hard. Yes. And rise um, of, the rise of Hans. The rise of right? Hans. And uh, episode one drops today. We'll put, we should put, um, I was unprepared for the show entirely, so I, I should have that as a link for people, but we'll put that in maybe our show notes or I'll put it in the Instagram feed so people can yeah. go check it out. You know, we'll also, you know we should I'll also have you. him back on the show to just like give a little plug for it because it's a fun show. It's really good. The Rise of Haunts. Um, yeah, and we both appear in it. I think mm -hmm. I say seven, maybe eight words. But you say them very well. So well. Yeah. yeah. Each You say each of them very, each very well. well. I could, I could understand. They weren't run together. I knew each word, what they meant. It's clear. Well, in the olden days, I had a voiceover career. So, you know. You and me both. Long ago in a... Once we had a railroad, made it run. Made it run, <laughs> yeah. Brother, can you spare anything? Literally, brother, uh, you're my brother. Can you spare brother, me? Brother, can you spare time? All right. So, where is the doctor? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. So, we're going to talk about a movie. Let's talk about a movie. Let's talk about a movie called What was it called? Oh, Straight Jacket. Straight Straight Jacket. Do you Okay, so, had you seen it before? You know, I had seen this movie before. Okay, me too. And I think I saw it, my, my prior relationship with this movie, and, and people who know me will, will understand that this explains a lot about me. I think I saw it when I was six years old um, or seven. That's too young. It's way too young. I'm going to tell you that's too young. As I was watching it, there were images from this movie that, uh, that I knew I had seen before between between fingers like like this or yeah i had seen that before i didn't remember really much about the movie but i had seen that before and maybe i didn't remember much about the rest of the movie because i was in a state of shock as you got child. very triggered by this movie then i well, i had seen opening, it before that... but like 10 years ago so i was ready 20 years of pure hell <laughs> <laughs> that opening sequence is it's it's something else so damn good yeah it's so damn good the fact that they thought it was okay to show the i mean i could see the images of joan crawford killing the people in the bed i could see having a scene in which you see uh the young girl witnessing something that we don't see that is horrifying to her but juxtaposing those two images is I mean, that's as scary and brutal as stuff you see in movies nowadays. Uh, it's really disturbing. Yeah, it's 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 a it's the it has a lot of weird punch. This movie, like it really, because you're ready for you're ready for a lot of things it does deliver, like high camp and extreme melodrama on steroids, and you know, ridiculously overinflated plot moments and stuff. And then it has moments that are 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 kind of indelible, you know. I mean, they really are. They really go farther than you think a movie. With, with, you know, with all these people in it, like with the Joan Crawford movie, you're just not expecting it. No. So let me let me just flat out ask this: Did you like it? 
You ask too many questions. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That was one. Yeah, 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 I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. I, I, I it, it not only held up a second mm. time as an adult seeing it, you know, like in terms of surprising me because I'd forgotten some of the things about it since I saw it last, and it has a lot of surprises. It never, it never lets up. It's continually engaging. It's consistently, the tone stays consistent, whatever that weird tone is. Um, and uh, and it, it has some genuinely fun, horrifically scary things in it as well to me. I, you know, it's got a great mix of stuff. And it's definitely drawing from, from other better made movies. Um, you know, more like Psycho. There's a lot of Psycho in here. And it's also, you know, written by the same guy who wrote the book for Psycho. So there's actual Psycho DNA. Um, there's a lot of Diabolique, you know. There's a lot of real interesting kind of gothic horror influences. And I like the way it's shot. Um, how about you? Do you like it or are you just amazed by it? Well, I got to tell you the truth. Something wrong? <laughs> I loved it. Okay, I, great. Mother! I loved, fantastic. I loved it, and I will watch it again. Fantastic. I, I adored this movie. Isn't it amazing? I, 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 yeah, good, cool, cool. Even uh, so in we... the places where you say this was not well-crafted, necessarily, I, I, I felt, and, and this is into a discussion that we've had before, even in the places where it wasn't well necessarily well crafted, I felt like it was crafted with intention that they that they were doing exactly what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And and it all, you know, they might have been saying, well, this is kind of crass or this is kind of, you know, this is kind of camp or this is kind of this or this is kind of that. But God damn it, that's what we're going to do. And and they sold it, you know, I and want the I, truth. And I bought it. I bought it hook, line, and sinker oh, from great. beginning to end. That's great. I'm so excited. I'm so happy. <laughs> so we found, we kind of found a movie that represents a lot of the things I love about midnight movies and like what the hell's going on here? Movies. A lot of those have, you haven't responded to like with love. You've thought some of them were funny. Or yeah. whatever, but this seems to be the one where you're like, no, I I get this one. I I like I like where this is going. No, you and, can... if, and if I had been asked to, if I was asked to work on a movie like this, and they said we're going to make a movie, I I'd be I'd be on board a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I would go. Do you think these will go with my new outfit? William Castle, you know, he's no uh, he's no joke. He no. directed sixty seven movies, something like that. You well, know, I'll... like. He's directed a ton of movies. He directed a ton. And, you know, he he um, he um produced Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And he really wanted to direct that movie. I, I think one of the one of the great pleasures of life is to sit there at night while you're trying to go to sleep and think of what William <laughs> Castle's version of Rosemary's Baby would have been exactly. Would have been a little Shot bit. for shot. Like, what yeah. would have he done with it? Apparently, he watched whatever happened to Baby Jane over seventeen times. I can say, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, maybe now I can help. It's cool because he's he's learned a lot by this point. Straight Jacket is late in his directing career, and other movies like you know Thirteen Ghosts and House on Haunted Hill were are fun Halloween movies, no doubt. But <clears throat> they're a little bit more you know, shocktastic. Like it's all about gimmicks and right. silly effects. And this one, you can see he re he's really, really watching like other horror movies like Hitchcock and, 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 um, like Aldrich's other stuff too, like, like baby Jane. And you can see him trying to design these sequences with a lot of impact, you know? And I think he succeeds to, in a large extent, despite the, the work of, Despite the work of what's his name, I gotta call him out. I'm sorry, but Richard Albane, 
the special effects designer in this film could have upped his game a little bit. Um, specific, specifics, please. Um, they're they're just whenever they there's a lot of heads getting chopped off in this movie, and there are some quick cuts of actual heads coming off. Like oh, the the George uh, the George Kennedy head coming off. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, that that you know, and even the 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 heads in her dream when she's dreaming about this. And we should explain what this movie is in a second. Yeah. But Joan, Joan Crawford has a dream wherein she's reliving things from her sordid past. And the heads in that dream look like they are mannequin heads. And I thought that they could have done some more interesting effects work in general. That's just my only complaint. But Richard Albain, <sighs> you know what the last movie he did before this was? No. The Three Stooges go, go around the world in a daze, it was called. And I think that he had maybe confused the style of that, the effects in that movie with this. That's loud and really disturbing. Those pigs aren't being harmed. They're enthusiastically eating. Yeah. Perhaps somebody, but they're having lunch. We are we are informed that the sound effects of the heads being chopped off um, in this was the prop man wielding an axe and cutting watermelons in half with an axe, which That'll you know, it. which is the job. That's the job. It's a nice foley. That's you know who was uh, who's, who's many people consider responsible for the, the that that the creation of that kind of foley work. Who? Apparently, Akira Kurosawa. Really, was one of the first people to design gruesome sound effects um, uh, to put underneath all the samurai sword fights. So he had, he'd have a, a, a Foley guy just working all the time, stabbing chickens and stabbing, you know, <laughs> stabbing chickens? watermelon. Like they, they, they living have chickens. No, not alive. Like, you know, a chicken that in a restaurant. Um, That's not the sound of chicken and, makes when it's stabbed. When have you done this? How would you know? The, oh, I actually do know the sound that chickens make when they're stabbed. Oh, God. I was at uh, boarding school. So you did work on a farm, and you may again. I did work on a farm for three years at boarding school. and we, I never thought my brother would end up running a farm again. We slaughtered chickens, and I did my time cutting the heads off of slaughtered chickens with a small hatchet. Okay. I did uh, spend time. I think we just lost some viewership right there. Uh, I don't understand. I don't either. But I mom, think Mom Mason mom, said mom, it wasn't pig heads. I think is what she I think meant. she meant pig heads. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad about all of that. I whether not, whatever it was. I did not. Uh, I did not cut off any pigs' heads, Mom. Okay. I promise. I promise you. Look, this isn't Matthew's fault. This was the, what the educational system was like in the in the seventies. Yeah, you know, it explains a lot about me. Um, um, it explains why uh, Ralph Meeker in Kiss Me Deadly looks like a you know some some cool cat I'd like to hang out with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this, the many things are coming clear about this show, about yeah. you on this show. <laughs> so let's let's explain what this movie is. Could, the, the quick plot synopsis is the movie. <laughs> The movie starts with um, a uh, uh, a murder, a horrible murder, because this this woman comes home from a late night and finds her husband uh, in bed with another woman, and she goes crazy and kills them both with an axe. Her husband, her, the six million dollar man. We, yes, we might add Lee Majors. Lee Majors' first role. Yeah, and his name was like Lee Murky Mor- Maloney or L- yeah. something that she couldn't pronounce it. Yeah. And he changed his name to Lee Majors because of the fact that Joan Crawford couldn't pronounce his name on this movie. It was Harvey Harvey something. Was Yearly, Yar, Yar, Har, Harvey Earl Har- Yearly or something. Yeah, like Harvey that. Yarley or <laughs> something. Um, and uh, so it was because thanks to her confusion. So um, this is all in the very beginning of the movie. She has a little daughter who witnesses the murder. And then uh, Joan Crawford goes to a mental institution. Harvey Lee Yeary. That's his name. Uh, flash forward 20 years. The daughter's grown up and living on a 
farm with her uncle and aunt. Yeah, her okay. uncle and and his, and her aunt by marriage. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, Joan Crawford gets let out of the mental institution and gets to come home. And they please, <clears throat> I need you now. And she does, and a mystery ensues. Um, and uh, the question of whether is Joan Crawford okay? Is she really healed? Is she is she is she still a killer? We don't or know. She, or is she is she killing again? Right. People start dying. Um, and that's the you know that's basically the plot. Uh, and the daughter the daughter is in love with a young man who's also in love with her who comes from a very wealthy family and they're contemplating getting married. That right. The, the daughter played it. by the wonderful Diane Baker. Um, oh my God. What a revelation she is. Yeah, in she's, this movie. she's great. Uh, also from the movie Marnie and silence of the lambs, which she made much later, in which she played the Senator whose daughter gets kidnapped. She's yes. really terrific. Um, and Long pulls career. off, pulls off a very complicated role here. Like, yeah, uh, and, and and could have done that. Could have this this uh, performance could have been in a much more sophisticated a a picture. Her you know, performance, like absolutely. Movie, you know, yeah. Um. So yeah, that's the plot. Uh, we'll probably give things away as we go because it's old. And uh, if you don't want to know things, don't come here because yeah. we are a fountain of knowledge. So I'm um, now now I think we know enough. I'm going to get into the cocktail recipe. Okay, what's the what's the cocktail recipe? You're gonna have to. We're bear spending with me. an awful lot of money. You're gonna have to bear with me because when I first start to describe it, you're gonna be like, "Ew!" But it's actually this is I'm gonna I haven't made it yet. I'm gonna make it. It's gonna be spectacular. Um, it's called the Bloody Lucy because that's Joan Crawford's character's name in this. Lucy Harbin, yeah. Right. It's a take on a Bloody Mary using instead of vodka do you know do you know what fat washing is with uh whiskey uh i was gonna make a joke about why don't you have some milk um (laughs) so i was no what is it? it this is a real thing uh so it's it will be made this drink will be a bloody mary made with bacon fat washed batch 22 and the process <laughs> they they do this with bourbon. <laughs> they do do this with bourbon. Bear with me. <laughs> They're not going to let me get it out. <laughs> I'm using bacon fat washed uh, batch twenty two because of the constant reference to slaughtering pigs in this movie. Okay. Um, and the way you f- they do this with bourbon, the way you fat Has the bacon wash- the fat. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. The way. You fat- <laughs> yeah, there you go. The way you fat wash a whiskey is you. You take, uh, you make some bacon, you cook it slowly so that you're rendering all the fat out. Then you take a jar and fill it with your whiskey, bourbon, or in my case, it's going to be batch 22. And you add the bacon fat to that and let it sit for a day. Leave me alone! Then you put that into the freezer. And what's going to happen in the freezer is the fat and the whiskey are going to completely separate because whiskey won't freeze, but the fat will. It will completely rise to the top. You cut that off, remove all of the fat, and then run it through a coffee filter one or two, you know. She's insane! Mm -hmm. To remove all of the particulate, and what you are left with is just the flavor from the bacon fat but no actual fat. I'm going to save the time and order a cheeseburger, a, a bacon <laughs> cheeseburger and a scot and a scot and a, and a scot. <laughs> Where yeah. is the doctor? Well, that, that sounds um, like it would be amazing. Like it's almost like you'd uh, like smoke, like the way that they smoke like, foods. It's gotta... Exactly. So then yeah. I'm going to do that with batch 22 and then use that fat washed bacon, fat washed batch 22 with bloody Mary. I want to make it clear to the folks at home that we don't we don't get any money from Batch Twenty Two. Uh, we don't we don't like uh, they're not su- sponsoring the show or anything like no. that. This is just. Uh, this but is just I, I'll get talking. money. For, I'll get bit money from Batch Twenty Two if the business ever takes off. Oh, I, I'm not saying we wouldn't. I'm just saying that right now that it's not. Yeah, no, it's not. 
but uh um so okay so so the rest of it is is bloody mary bloody mary yeah. Okay, so the only thing you're doing is 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 dealing with the is uh, refining the batch twenty two itself before it goes into the drink. Before it goes into it. the Bloody Mary. Although we have we have a spectacular Bloody Mary recipe up on our website that right. we call the Bloody Viking, which is our particular take on a Bloody Mary. Uh, Pepperoncini is one of the big uh, big uh, additions to okay. it. Okay. I'd say like you could also spend some time carving some radishes into little heads. And putting them in the drink. That would be that would be the garnet. Yeah. Would be a, a radish head of some So um I have uh many things to say about the movie. I'm curious because this is we're in territory that our producers are very uh, uh fond of. Yeah. And I know that they had yeah. uh, a couple of things that they wanted to mention, uh, maybe a question or two that they had for us. Should we bring should we bring them on now to uh to straighten this out sure okay uh if you're i have a long i have a long list of things to point out about the movie as well i do too i do too that's spectacular at the end of the movie Hi! hi hi alexis alexis is here I'm here and I have a question for both of you. Um, okay. I, I want to know your thoughts on, on this one element of the film. Yes. Okay. So Joan Crawford and her daughter go shopping on what looks like Wilshire Boulevard. And they go and they pick out this dress, which I believe is the exact same dress that she wore on the night that she murdered her husband and his girlfriend, right? And they, they get her like the, the jingling bracelets and the earrings and the wig. And everyone, I, I just, I really want to know, do you think that they are actually picking out these exact things? Or do you think it's just kind of in her, in her mind, she's picturing that she's wearing these things? Because if they picked out her exact outfit from 20 years before, why would they do that? <laughs> what do you think these are going to find new outfit? I hadn't, you know, I hadn't, that's a really good question. I, I, I hadn't really thought that uh, while I was watching the movie. I just took it at face value that we were in a universe in which dress styles hadn't changed in 20 years and you could just simply go to Sears and get that dress again. Uh, so I guess I assumed it was the same, but let me think about that for a second. Do you have a thought, Matthew? Do you, what do you think? Yeah, I'm thinking that that it was knowing what we know at the end of the movie that the daughter is purposefully doing that getting a dress as either the same or as i didn't notice that because i i you know don't notice things um but i did notice with the earrings and the wig that she wants her to get i think that's all part of the daughter's plot to create to to mess with her mother's head as much as she can um Take me and lock her up, my fair lady. Because she that was at that point know. doing the had the recording already of the the all that stuff to start messing with her head. Right, because like that part that Elia just played, that was what really confused me. Because I, I I assume that we're we're to understand that she's just imagining that the kids are are doing the Lizzie Borden rhyme with her name. Right. Um, because otherwise, like, why would would she agree to dressing up in the same outfit that she killed people in 20 years earlier? Well, I think you've struck one of the great crazy pleasures of of the Crawford performance here is like, I, I think the big question I have is exactly what you just said. Like, what, the fact that she just gleefully finds these these fetishistic like objects from this murder that she was involved in that she committed without referencing at all that it's the same it is it is completely bananas and it is the most melodramatic thing about this yeah. movie and it's following that um her daughter says in the car which is uh we we girls need to look our best <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> dress her up in the dress she killed people in it is and it what a dress too like wow it's very I, specific one of the interesting things about this movie too is that they 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 really don't 
go in, into detail about the kind of person that Joan was before going to the mental institution. But they imply that she's quite a live wire, like she must be out going to parties all night long because she slips into a completely different personality when the doctor comes to visit. And it feels right. like, oh, that must have been her. I'm wondering if there wasn't more of that backstory uh, layered in to another cut of this or to an original script. Maybe, because I remember like one of the first times that we meet her when she's stepping off of the train the night of the murder. Um, and there's the daughter's narration and she says something like, oh, and she was um, a woman, very much a woman. Right. And, and, yeah, and very much aware of the fact they say. Very like, much what, aware of the fact. What does that, that mean? Woman. <laughs> like oh, I know what that means. And, and was aware of it. Mm -hmm. and, but then she does kind of like that, that slinky walk to yeah. the farmhouse. So she's, she's kind of like a party girl. Yeah. And, and there's a weird part of it that almost makes it a little bit like, it's kind of perverse because it's almost then like a pro murder dudes with an ax movie. Yeah. You know, it really yeah. is secretly very much on her side about all of it, which I love, which I really dig. Just like mm -hmm. Big Little Lies. Same thing. Pro murder the guy. Exactly. Had, I, now, I haven't seen Big Little Lies, but um, yeah, it's very pro that it feels like. So uh, this is a, were you new to this movie? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Yeah. I figured this was one that you'd maybe uh uh, uh, scene like because it this definitely like the baby Jane is the gateway to like all the late period Joan Crawford and there's so many great things here. Had you you'd seen yeah. Trog before though, right? No, we hadn't actually. Oh, we'd, okay. we'd heard about it. We we we'd known of both of them from years earlier, but just like never never really got around to watching them. Okay. Um, but actually, like on that note, um, did you notice that there was there were kind of like some Betty Davis moments? in yes. Joan Crawford's performance? Yes. Like, very much so. Well, I kind of feel like the bad girl part, like her her other personality, uh, you know, because she comes back from the mental institution very kind of almost like a nun. She's very kind of buttoned down with with very, um, you know, simple clothes and, and nothing, nothing fancy, no jewelry. But this person she was before was really, like, you know, expressive with her clothes and her hair and everything. Um, what do you, what do you think, um, what, you ask too many questions. How many years after, how many years after baby Jane was this? Baby Jane was 60, right? So we're like three years later. Yeah. And also Joan Crawford had final approval of the script and she, when they first presented it to her, she had it specifically rewritten. And I wonder if if the character like somehow in those rewrites kind of changed more into a baby Jane. Maybe so. Well, Maybe one so. of the things that I read was the, the biggest rewrite was the scene that was added at the end of her wrapping things up and explaining it, that the movie originally ended with the daughter screaming, she's insane, she's insane. And Joan Crawford was not happy with, that being the last image the, the, she wanted the audience to be remembering her at the end of the movie not the daughter so they add that last scene which is just horrible that's the one scene in the movie i'm like really we needed this scene where she's wrapping it all up for us the only reason that i kind of like that scene is because to me it acts like a satire on the questionable ending of psycho like right psycho has a similarly like a weird ending where the psychiatrist comes in and explains all the behavior <laughs> as if it's going to make everybody happy. That's the funny thing about it. He's like talking to this poor, the sister of the woman who got murdered. And he's like, you'll be happy to know this is what <laughs> it's really yeah. weird and out of tune. Um, and it's almost like they were kind of using that as a, as a structure, like, well, you have to have that scene because that's what happens in these movies. And they kind of did their version of it, which kind of cracked me up. But I also find similarly found it was so funny that Crawford doesn't play it at all sad that her daughter is in is in a mental institution now. She's just kind of relieved that this is all over, you know? Yes. Well, that's like there were there were several <laughs> moments in which the daughter would say something and Joan Crawford would just have kind of this 
this very Midwestern look of annoyance before then saying something like, oh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> but like, I just, I love that. Um, I love seeing that in her eyes. No filter. She just, everything flashes through her face at one point. Or maybe heaven for yourself. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite line from the movie or was it the very much a woman and very much aware of it? Oh, actually, yeah, I do have a favorite line. Um, and it's after the whole opening of the daughter um, explaining everything that happened to her boyfriend. And the boyfriend is listening, you know, very attentively. And then he sits down next to her and, and takes both of her hands in his and he says, but don't you see, Carol, it doesn't matter. That's in my notes. That's my favorite line. Ah! It's the funniest thing I ever heard. I paused My it. mother is a murderer. Don't you see? It doesn't matter. <laughs> now, of course it wouldn't. Oh, and the daughter's obsession with, um, with, uh, murderess or no i'm not a sculptor i'm a sculptress I'm a sculptress right <clears throat> i liked um my favorite lines in the movie were at the beginning of the cocktail party when one one why don't you have some milk says how do you like this liqueur well it tastes different and that's the end of the conversation <laughs> that's it it's like... we'll just politely <laughs> say it tastes different <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you have, okay, so, uh, do you have, um, do you have, like, uh, uh, recasts and stuff like that? No, do I? Too? No, Alexis. No. Oh, recasts. No, I um, just wondered, we because we'll, we'll come back to that at the end, at the end of the show, like, like normal, but if you, if you do, uh, uh you should, or if you don't, maybe make a list, because I want to hear what your recast of it would be. Okay, I'm going to think about it, and, okay. um, before I go... Um, did you catch the Pepsi shot? Oh yeah, oh, of course. Oh yeah, it's great. Yeah, and the best one I've ever seen. The best I mean, one. What is it really? Great product placement. If your product is in the home of two psychopathic murderers, like is that that's yeah. their in their kitchen? I I feel it sends a strange message. Well, if you notice, it was unopened, so oh. maybe they're not drinking it. It's like it doesn't hit the same. They're way. allergic to Pepsi. They don't. Yeah, yeah. they didn't drink it. Yeah. Yeah, the Pepsi's got to be there. Okay, thank you, Alexis. We'll come back for a recast. Wow. That, I love for those that. of you at home that don't <clears throat> see that, because they're not watching it on YouTube, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, the logo... Is that's the first example of a logo that I've seen that I saw people messing with. I'm sure people did it before this, but I remember like in the eighties with Raiders of Lost Ark and stuff, they messed with right. the Paramount logo and that became a thing. This was such an early example of that. Yeah. So for the people who can't see it, it's the it's the Columbia logo, the Columbia statue, and uh but her head is cut off and sitting at her feet. The other time I remember seeing that with with this statue, this logo is in um uh, Cat Baloo, where oh. where the uh, where the logo comes to life and starts shoot starts shooting like uh, you know, Lee Marvin punches it in the face. Yeah, um, it's a lot of lot of fun there. Um, things that that jumped out at me, just great little moments that I love in terms of the the campy style of making this movie is the the murders cutting to the sc the screaming. Uh, rooster, the murders cutting to the screaming pigs, um, uh, the bathroom as a cell. When we're suddenly, she's she's suddenly we have this this weird cut. She's on her way to a party. The mother and daughter are on their way to a dinner party where where Joan Crawford will be meeting the the boyfriend's parents for the first time, and she's terribly uncomfortable about going there. And then we have this weird cut to her a shot from above of her in a, in a weird, like it's a bathroom cell and we think we're in a dream sequence. I, I completely disoriented. What the hell is going on here? And then finally she's screaming, let me out. And it's terrible. And you're like, well, this is a weird turn for the movie to take. And then the daughter opens the door to what it turns out is a bathroom. And Joan Crawford had spilled some coffee on herself and had to go into this bathroom while her daughter got the coffee out. Yeah. But it's a weird, disorienting 
Yeah, Yeah, I mean, they're they're doing some really, um, some smart things in the camera, you know. (laughs) They're telling the story visually. There's so many, like, uh, images of bars and, you know, strips of light that are, like, in that bathroom that has the wallpaper of, like, basically prison bars. You see that over and over and over again. But it's it's really thoughtfully done. It's much more German expressionist than kind of cheapo, you know. And my uh, favorite example of that, of what you're talking about, is the very first time we really see the mother and daughter together. They're walking through the farm, and there's this high, high crane shot of the two of them walking across the yard. And there's one of those uh, windmill things, not an old Dutch windmill, but the ones with the small bladed metal bladed fan that is used to to run a well uh and and the the blade is spinning really fast almost as fast as an airplane propeller and this crane shot of the yard as they walk through it and they're walking through the yard and they walk into i mean they're on the ground obviously but the visual is of them walking into the spinning blades of this windmill and it's such a great metaphor of <clears throat> what is going to happen to these two women in their relationship. Yeah. And going back and looking at some of the, the scenes and, and pictures of it, like stills from it after watching it last night, I, I, I really, I'm really like anxious to see it again pretty soon, <clears throat> literally, because there are, it, it tracks so well. There are, you know, you, you really do get surprised that it's the daughter kind of at the end. Like they bury that pretty well. You know, it's, one of these characters you know and you think well maybe it's the daughter but they don't really tip it off t- to me until the end no i and, was thinking it often but well she does weird things like you notice that she's buying the dress that looks like the murder dress yeah. you you notice that she's introduced saying things like you know um i'm dying to meet you or i've i was dying to see you she like point i don't understand <laughs> and and yet they bury the lead. She's good enough in it, you know. Diane Baker's good enough in it to 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 kind of like. The, it's sleight of hand. It's really good because you should expect her from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I have and, a question about something, um, and I I think I know an answer to this, but I want you to ask too many questions. <laughs> the scene where she meets her daughter's boyfriend for the first time, and her. It's insane. It's completely insane. Her change of personality, her turning into that previous incarnation of herself in front of her daughter, just behaving in the worst kind of sex crazed, alcoholic monster mother on a dime turning into that. Um, she puts it's, her fingers in the guy's mouth, man. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's way weird. over the top. But it's the only time in the movie that she really engages in that kind of behavior. And it's it's such a, a misdirect to make us really believe that she's the one who's crazy and is, you know, still crazy and doing the murders. But it seems to me somewhat out of character with the rest of what's going on with her post-treatment. But I'm wondering if... I I keep trying to justify it to myself because I so want the movie to work in every way. And so what I'm wondering is, is it just a a momentary slip into her, into her past that she has um, the the way that somebody who was an alcoholic or a drug, drug addict could come out of treatment and have a slip. Is that how we're supposed to view that? Um, that's how I took it. Okay. That's how I took it. Uh, I thought, you know, I think, but it must be said, like, that's not, I was almost surprised at the level that this hung together. Like, I, you know, so there's something I kind of almost liked about that being completely out of nowhere, because that's the kind of move I expect and love from these, these WTF, like, what is going on here movies. Why don't you have some milk? 
<laughs> where where things happen that don't make sense and you're just left going what what in god's name so there's enough of that going on there that i kind of liked that insane just melodrama on speed quality to it oh but yeah the thing i took away from it was that she you know did lapse but i think you could take it darker and say that the problems that she suffered that she was a much more damaged person than anybody really names in the movie that you, you mean more you know, damaged than somebody who murders her husband with an than the normal person who murders well, their husband with an act. Of course. But I mean, they go through great pains to explain it was an act of passion and it wasn't a premeditated kind of crazy murder thing. You right. know I mean, that's not that that excuses it, but it's certainly I mean, you know, people go crazy sometimes. Just saying, I, I myself I like her just the way that you like Mike Hammer. Let's face it. OK, there we go. Um, <laughs> you want to hang uh, out with her? No, but I feel like they do. They do go through pains to kind of not, you know, they don't. They don't moralize about it, which I appreciated. No. You're allowed to like her, even though she has problems, you know. And I, I don't understand. Well, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta say, I like the movie from jump. The minute it starts, it starts just. It's very Sam Fuller the way it starts. Did you ever see, uh, like Shock Corridor or Naked Kiss? No, it's very naked kiss. And we should cover that sometime. Um, but it starts with a gut punch and it's crazy. And you're like, you know, there's noises and sounds and screams and fast cutting. You don't know what's happening. And then it it's it, then the title started. And it's this very lush, like opening title sequence that show all these paintings. And I, I'm fascinated by this. I love these paintings. Um, I didn't have a chance to go and research who did them. So if. If Alexis or Sophia, you have any intel on who did the paintings in the title sequence, I'd love to know. They're like, um, they're kind of like Goya paintings or, you know, a little bit like um, Francis Bacon. They're very disturbing very portraits, disturbing. kind of abstracts of uh, surrealist abstracts of 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 the murder and the psychological state of her in in lockdown. They're really creepy paintings. And the painting of Joan Crawford, there's a portrait of her that's stunning. And I actually would love to track that down and buy that if that exists anywhere. It probably was burned in some studio fire. But I'm fascinated by that. And I'd love to know who did them. They're really cool. The but sculpture. I also don't know what the hell they have to do with the movie, though. Because right. there's, our daughter's a sculptress. And uh, her words, not mine. Right? Doesn't she say a sculptress? Sculptress, yeah. Um, I would just Joan, say sculptor. Joan Crawford says sculptor, and the right. daughter corrects her and says sculptress. Right. Um, so I don't know why there were paintings there, but I still liked the whole conceit. Um, apparently the paintings might be the work of somebody named Bert Schoenberg, but they're going to double check that for us. Well, Bert did some nice work with that. He um did. I uh, do you, did you notice uh, other um, film references and stuff in here? Because there were a few. Mm. There's a few films that really like. I know that he studied Baby Jane, but I think there's a couple others. Well, I I'm not. I think this movie uh, came out. I'm not sure when HUD came out, but I kept thinking of HUD because of the pigs in the farm. No, Interesting. I'm kidding. Interesting. <laughs> Never um, black and white. <laughs> You know, I, George Kennedy in this movie and Paul Newman in HUD, I really felt like they interchangeable. were trying to tap into that. Interchangeable. Yeah. <laughs> Same kind of raw kinetic power as performers, just yeah. raw sexuality yeah, that raw you get sexual, off George Kennedy in this is of George it's Kennedy. on fire. <laughs> it's on fire. Um, did um, you notice the, uh, I got a lot of um, vertigo out of this movie. Oh yes, with the, the the shots of the of the top of the rope and the top of the bar. Yeah, with everything. that. Yeah. But there's a there's another aspect to it. There's a there's a heavy vertigo thread in this movie, um, for me, which was the was the dressing up as this other person. Oh yeah, you know, and the creation of this alternate identity that pleased the daughter that she kind of manipulated the mother to go look like her old self. I thought was so much like vertigo and um, how they played that off with like the, the black wig as opposed to her kind of gray hair and it would switch on and off. 
I, I thought that, and there, there's a clue in the, in the movie too. I think very pointedly that shows that he watched Vertigo as many times as he watched Baby Jane because she has the when she comes home from <clears throat> lockdown. There's a shot where she goes and embraces um, Diane Baker for the first time, embraces her daughter, and you see Diane Baker's face over her shoulder. And the first time you see the movie, you're like, oh, she's shocked and scared. And then when you see the movie and you finish the movie, you go back to see that shot, you realize that she's plotting and thinking, which is an amazing right. close-up. But from behind, Joan Crawford's hairstyle is exactly the Carlotta uh, swirl from um, the museum scene in Vertigo. And mm. it's the same kind of slow push into that um, on the back of her head. And I was like, this has got to be a complete nod. Yeah. And well, and all of the images of femininity in the movie, femininity ah! are very, <laughs> very Hitchcock. They're very, yeah. they're very Marnie, very, you know, uh, Carol Baker's entire performance is so. Um, you mean Dar Diane Baker? Diane Baker. So it's such. Um, and I don't mean this as a criticism because I think she's doing it on purpose. Uh, she does it so well. The, it's a veneer. It's so polished. Yeah. Um, she looks perfect all the, you know, flawless all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and even there's one scene in which she comes in and she looks stunning and she's in this stunning dress and says, oh, I... I still have to get dressed for dinner. And it's like, what, what you're going to dress up from that for dinner? You know, this is you dressed that, you know, it's all this perfection. Mm. Um, so that then at the end, when you see the, the disarray underneath, it's so incredibly shocking. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, and also a movie that's dealing with, you know, kind of murder and psychopathy in a new way in movies you know it feels like after psycho they were really able to kind of um open the floodgates on the kinds of stories they were telling also kind of reminded me of of you know even in cold blood you know which came later but just the 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 level of like horror that they were that they were really talking about. And this woman, this woman chops people up with an axe. And when she goes crazy, she just doesn't stop. Like, it's really kind of horrific. They don't show you the actual gore except in one flash cut. But the impl the implied violence is really, really rough. Yeah. Well, this is this of yours? the heavy handedness of some of the Im imagery which supports that what you're talking about of the of the implied violence the carving of the roast yeah yeah the roast that they pick is just it, i mean it looks it's a delicious roast you've ever seen yeah it looks delicious but it's also the juiciest bloody it just oh my god yeah um and there's so many heavy handed images like that but but again, not accidentally heavy handed, purposefully. Right. And also some very jagged cutting and some very like brutally shocking editing going on in it. Jarring editing, which is like like an axe attack. It doesn't feel it doesn't have the finesse. You know, it's it feels rough yeah. in, in, in a way that that that's 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 with the story, you know, and that just like I think attack. that kind of is an example of like of you know because let's face it uh this director is he's not considered like one of the great american directors although maybe reviewing his stuff would make you change that opinion but it's like style director story cast all came together to create something bigger than the sum of its parts almost yeah. and it was just like you know even even um William Castle's shortcomings as a director worked as a benefit to this particular story and movie in a way, you know, the things that, that are weird or clunky about it feel unnerving. They feel like dreamlike and strange in a, in a fun way, you know? 
what what other performances stand out for you in this film? Well, I got to say, like, I think the guy that played her doctor is is really notable. Um, this this older gentleman. And what a, to visit. what a what a career. That Nervous? I know. Um, cause if you check out his IMDB, it's, um, it's the easiest IMDB page to read of, of any ever, because there's only one credit on it. And that is this movie, this movie, because um, he was Mitchell, a... Mitchell Cox made one movie and it was, was this movie. Yeah. It's a PepsiCo board member. He was a, he was a PepsiCo board member that Joan Crawford decided to cast without asking permission apparently she just decided he was going to do it and they i think probably the studio got a little nervous but they were like well let's make joan happy she has just made baby jane after all and was making them a ton of money and so she i guess thought this guy was right on the money but she should have been a casting person because this guy's great like he's so not acting, i had no but he's clue so... when i went to look up i was like i want to see what else that guy's been in and he's like oh my god no, he's, he's not an actor it's great yeah it was incredible just going on I his also, fishing trip i adored edith atwater as the boyfriend's mother oh she's great yeah yes get I your hands see... off of me <laughs> i want to see so much more of her get your hands off of me and then her boyfriend no career Poor guy just really didn't have much of a career. No, no, no. Some I think it's because of that. I think it's because of that one shot where he had some crap in his hair. I don't know if you know, noticed that. No, there was one shot where he's got like some in the OTS. There's a little crap in the back of his, of his hair. It's like they didn't pick that up. Nobody picked that up. I didn't see it. Yeah. Like, I liked saw- I liked his dad too, the 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 dairy farmer guy. Oh yeah, wonderful. He was great. Um, uh, I enjoyed. He had, everybody he had in quite it. a career. That fellow. W- was he uh, also a Pepsi board member? How- Howard St. John? No, he was not. He worked a lot. That guy. Um, it's always interesting to see a guy like George Kennedy early, early on. Too. This has got to be, you know, one of his early roles. Um, he's much much skinnier. Much more kind of ruggedly handsome, if you called this handsome, I don't know. Skinnier than the New Centurion days or whatever, yeah. Um, but uh, like, when did he start? Okay, so he started in uh, you know, in TV like 1959. Uh, so this was pretty early on. Um, pretty grimy, pretty pretty disgusting. Yeah. How about uh, Leif Erikson, who plays her uncle? Just um, the cheeriest guy. I mean, cheeriest. if I ever come back from a mental institution after having killed lots of people, I hope I hope somebody is as cheerful as that when I come home. Interesting fact about him: shot down twice in World War II. Um, didn't he also sail around the world in a? In that's a, a diff. That's a different Leif Erikson. Oh, okay. That's a different one. Yeah. But there's uh, Eric. That's Eric Leifson. Yeah. Um, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else notable yeah. to bring up here. I have a note. I didn't type them up, so that was stupid. And I don't have my glasses on. Oh, well, um, I like how the daughter keeps saying slaughter. She says slaughter over and over again. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other thing I noticed was that Joan and I have something in common. Um, knitting. That we're both knitters. You do, do like to knit. Do you suck on your knitting needles like she did I in that moment? I have never sucked. I on... want the truth. I have Tell never me now. sucked on my knitting needles. That I is the funniest. That she just had to find a pointed moment, and that was the pointed object yeah. she needed. Um. So, uh, so the bottom line is big thumbs up from both of us on on this one. Um, I, I I think it's terrific, man. I I will be seeing it again. It's it's going to be. It's a. It's going to be a Blu-ray purchase. It's. The, I've got plans for this movie. You got a double. I D K yo. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go with Shock Corridor. Um, ah! Sam Fuller's Shock Corridor, which was, uh, I think it would be a double bill because it's a similar style, similar time period, and I think it's kind of. It looks like the hospital. Maybe it, it's about a mental institution and a guy who goes undercover in as a journalist and pretends to be a crazy person in the mental institution. And um, it feels like that is where Joan Crawford went. 
Isn't there a movie um, about shock therapy with Joan Crawford or somebody like that? Where, um, Must be. I'm trying, it's, it's ringing a bell for me. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but I don't know what I, I, I This sounds very familiar to me, too. Um, but uh, that's what, that would be my double bill. What about yours? Um, mine was just Mommy Dearest. Not, not, very, not very good. Okay. Okay. Um, and, uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we see what, uh, what our producers have to say about it? Do you have, okay. do you have a, I also have a, how to watch and a, who are we and a recasting. So okay. got all, all right. those things. And I think my future has just arrived. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what's your, what, what do you say, Alexis? Okay. So we have our casting ready. Okay. Um, all right. This is courtesy of Sophia, my mother, and Elia. We all put our heads together, and this is what we've come up with. Anna Magnani or Fanny Bryce as Lucy, so replacing Joan Crawford. Carol Burnett as the daughter. As huh. Carol. Wow. Um, Michael J. Pollard as the daughter's boyfriend. Well, and he, he's in everything you guys do, I know. Yeah. And um, Gene Wilder is the chicken butcherer. <laughs> that was Elliot's choice. Um, written by Carolyn Keene, who's uh, the pseudonym of the authors of the Nancy Drew mystery series. And directed by Elaine May. Wow. Oh my God. Wow. That's a train wreck. Oh, you, you, went, you, took it, you took it farther with director. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. I, I mean, that, that, that is... Uh... That is of a, that is of a piece. That is all of like one uh, conceptual piece. And you also kind of cast through time, don't you? You don't use oh, like yeah. normal time as a thing, right? Ah! Don't make you ask too many questions. Because like what you know, what period uh, Carol Burnett like you know as the daughter? Oh, I think we have to ask Sophia that then. Okay. And also Elia. <clears throat> Let's bring them to the stream. All right, you get. Do you have a clarification for this? Sophia, you're on mute. Do you have clarification for what um, what eras of these these people, these actors? Uh, yes. So Anna Mignani and um, Fanny Bryce were both were both born around the early 1900s. Fanny Bryce was born in the late 1800s. Twenty years and of pure hell. <laughs> and um well carol kane we were actually thinking of at first as uh carol burnett as the mom and then carol kane as the daughter but they're roughly the same age both born in the 30s yeah. um gene wilder and carol and carol burnett i think are both born in 33 so that kind so your, of your casting is just unmoored in time it is it is flying through space with 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 uh from any time and any place i like that i think why not uh, so you could potentially have like a silent film actor cast up against, you know, Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Not yeah, in this right movie. For the role, but right for the role, you know? Okay. Can I, speak. I, I, yeah. I'm just want to get the term straight. I just want to know what, how we're, how we're working, working it through. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. What's yours, brother? Um, my, uh, my cat, I went for a straight recasting. Like if we were going to really do a remake of this movie. Mm-hmm. And I would put Nicole Kidman as Lucy. That's a good call. I thought of her as well. Caitlin Dever as the daughter. Um, uh, Caitlin Dever, remind Caitlin me. Caitlin Dever was in a, a mini series called Unbelievable. Um, and she's been in a bunch of stuff. She's a terrific young actor. Uh, Tom Holland as the boyfriend. Okay. Um, from the Spider Man movies. I had the same. Uh, I had the same casting on that one. Tom Holland. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. I cast Tom Holland as the boyfriend. That's ah! crazy. <laughs> right on the money, man. And, nice. Uh, and I didn't do the other roles except for the uh, except for George Kennedy. I want to see David Harbour's take. Oh, that's George a great Kennedy. call. That's a great, great call. Okay, I like that. I think that would be really fun. Hello, I'm yeah. quickly popping back on to say my mom thinks that the movie, the shock therapy movie that Matthew was referencing was The Snake Pit. No, oh, I think that's your correct. Yeah. No, that's no, that's a movie with the word shock in the title that I'm thinking of. 
Hmm. Okay. Not Shock Corridor, then. Not, Not Shock that. Corridor. Okay. Back to the drawing board. Um, Must be very lonely around here for someone like you. My recasting is uh, also semi-serious. Um, <clears throat> and I'm trying to keep it all within context of casting it today. Okay. So other than uh, where we agreed there on that boyfriend casting, I've got um, Parker Posey in the, uh, in the uh, Lucy role. Okay. John Crawford. Excellent. I've got Natalia Dyer from Stranger Things as the daughter. Which one is she in Stranger Things? She plays Nancy Wheeler, I think is the name. Um, I get it wholesale. She's, oh, the 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 older the older she she's the she's like the the journalist in the last. Why don't you have some milk? Come. Um, I'm gonna go for uh, as the uncle John Carroll Lynch. Oh yes. Yep. And as the aunt, I'm going to put Cece Spacek in this movie. So the two of them get to be a couple. Um, That's true. And the, uh, the uh, farmhand I'm giving to Giovanni Ribisi. Uh, so that's the George <laughs> Kennedy part. And the doctor, I want Donald Sutherland. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. That's my, uh, yeah. Did you cast yourself? Did you cast uh, Yes, I did. Um, uh, for you, uh, I, I thought you'd be uh, her father getting killed as he gets ready for bed. Just in that scene? I'm not uh, her father not her in father, other scenes. The father of the boyfriend. No, but the... Not, so well, you don't have some milk. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I, yeah, I thought you'd be... I the, get to be Lee Majors. No, 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 no. Uh, the boyfriend's father. Okay. But you just said when I just when I get killed, you just not only in that scene. No, no through the, he's whole, through scene. the whole movie, through the whole oh, movie. Okay, okay. But I thought of you as I'm watching this scene where he's very, very jauntily getting ready. You know, getting ready for right. bed. I thought interesting. Of you. you thought of me in the moment where he's getting murdered. You were like, oh, that would be a great part for Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think that's bad, wait till you come up with my role for me. Oh, you, you are, uh, you're, I had you as the doctor. Oh no, I, I have, I have something much more appropriate for me. Uh, I'm going to, uh, reprise my role in, uh, people soup and, uh, play one of the, the, the chicken that George Kennedy okay. cuts the head off. That's of. great. That's, that's great. That's <laughs> me. You could also go back in time and put pigtails on and be the little girl that grows up to be Diane Baker. Um, <laughs> Yes, excellent. I had uh, y you as the doctor, and then me as I cast myself as George Kennedy. Um, well, I, I'm auditioning for it, but Rubisi gets it. We don't get to be in this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I would say the best viewing experience, the way to see this movie, would be with your, would be on the phone watching it on television simultaneously with your college best college friend. I late would, at night. On the phone, eating junk food, talking about it as you're watching it in two different cities. I would totally agree with that, except that what you're eating is that you each have a huge platter of buffalo chicken wings and baby back ribs. That's that's okay. what you're eating as you watch this movie. I, I like it. I like it. Yeah. We're in lockstep. Yeah. We lockstep. agreed on this one. We're going to see it again. We have no idea what movie we're doing next week, do we? Well, Please, I need you now. Stick with our Crawford thing. Uh, if you want, we could keep with our Crawford flight, I suppose. Yes. If, you, if you'd like to. So what's next? Well, do you want to stick with late period Crawford and do The Caretakers? Because that's another movie worth seeing. Um, or we could do... Let's do early it. Cra early Crawford to like <laughs> stop making, you know, poking fun at her. Not that we're really poking fun at her, no, but I mean, I I bow to your wisdom. Okay, well, I'm gonna say let's see rain because listen to me. Our producers literally said typed in rain while I was thinking rain, and I think that that would be a good one if we can see it. Is it if I know I have it, but I don't know if, if we can. Is it rent available that one. on the Google? Rain. Not Ryan Johnson. Rain. Uh, 
It's on Amazon Prime for 99 cents right now. It's Let's also on Tubi. So I think Rain would be great. Uh, that's a classic. Wonderful. Have you seen Early Crawford? Matthew? I haven't. You're in for a treat. All right. Well, then we will see you all next week with 1932's Rain, starring <laughs> Crawford Houston. Yes. And, and Zero Pigs. Bondi and no a bunch pigs. of other people. No, no pigs. No chickens and pigs. Good night.